Welcome to this exploration themed film from Cambridge University Botanic Garden. Today I'm stood beside our wonderful Yoshino cherry, which really heralds the arrival of spring. And elsewhere in the garden, blossom is bursting and bees are buzzing. It's a wonderful time of year. But today we thought we'd have a look and explore some of the collections that grow behind the scenes in our private glass houses and share with you some of the stories about those plants. So we've headed in now to our alpine yard where you can see a plethora of colour behind me and some of our key plant collections here include our tulips, our fritillarias and our saxifragas that you can see in the background. And we're going to take a further look at some of the species here in the alpine yard. Our national collection of tulip species is one of our more extensive bulb collections and you can see it's just coming into flower at the moment and creating this beautiful range of rainbow colours. Tulips were first introduced to our gardens from the wilds of Asia in the 16th century and have been cultivated for many years since. But in the 16th century they also gave rise to the phase in Dutch history called tulip mania which led to the bankruptcy of many merchants in the Dutch market. But the collection today is much admired here in the garden. The plants in our collection are species, so these are what you would find if you were to explore the wilds to look for tulips. But in cultivation they've been bred and raised to give many of the hybrids that we're familiar with in our gardens today. But one of the more interesting and exciting species we have in the collection is this species that at the moment isn't flowering but is quite new to us. This is Tulipa regellii. It was first introduced into cultivation in 1886 by the Russian scientist Krasnov and he named it after the Director General of the Imperial Botanic Garden in St Petersburg who was Eduard Regel, hence the name Tulipa regellii. It's a beautiful plant even though you can't see any flower at the moment but it's much admired for these fantastic pleated leaves which have these very distinct ridges along them. This is a unique character of tulip species and we're excited to wait for the first flower of this plant which should have an open white star shaped flower with a yellow central hub. I'm now with our Fritillaria collection and you can see these along with all the other pots in the alpine yard are plunged in sand and this helps control the moisture level within the pots. Very often we'll water the sand rather than the, the pot itself and the plant will take up moisture through these lovely porous terracotta pots. This is Fritillaria suizophii, a Central Asian species of Fritillaria regarded as being a miniature crown imperial that many of us will be familiar with but you can see here these beautiful delicate pendant flowers of here an almost subtle green colouring but it does vary slightly in colour and this was named after a Russian botanist of the 19th century Suizov and another of those plants that commemorates a significant individual in the world of botany. Our national collection of saxifragas is in full flower as you can see at the moment. Absolutely beautiful, this kind of myriad of gem-like blooms. But one of the more unusual of the species saxifraga that we grow is saxifraga sempervivum here before me. And you can see these very unusual flower heads with tiny, tiny discrete flowers that you'd barely notice. But what makes this most interesting is it contains a chemical called betarite which was recently discovered as existing on saxifragas here in the garden. One of the exciting things about this particular plant is we've been working in collaboration with the Sainsbury Laboratory here at the Botanic Garden and have discovered that the crusted surface of this particular saxifraga contains a chemical called betarite which is only known from a few sea creatures and space meteorites. Knowing that we can gather and collect 
base right from this plant really helps phytochemical and the engineering industry and it's great to know that our plants are useful not just for their aesthetic value but also that they have a very practical application for the world. We're now inside the glasshouse range and sadly visitors aren't able to come and have a look here at the moment but we're still able to explore and we hope that when the glass houses are open again you too will be able to explore and see just what's looking magnificent and floral here in the houses. And as you walk in the door you're really hit by a wall of warmth and humidity really really gives you a great feeling of the sense of the tropics. You can also admire here this beautiful begonia convolvulacea which is supported by this wonderful plant, the powder puff plant, Caliandra hematocephala which has these fantastic scarlet pom-poms. This house is relatively newly planted up so there's lots to explore and learn and actually it would be lovely to see over the next few months how everything here fills out and takes up space. While we were in the tropical houses we wanted to point out something that some of you may be familiar with and this is a plant that has been a real horticultural and botanical highlight for us here in the garden this year. This is our moonflower, which flowered about a month ago and was the first time this was known to have flowered anywhere in the United Kingdom. It's called Selenicereus wittii. And you can see, as you look up the stem of this host plant, the spent flower, which flowered for only one night and produced a fantastic, immensely decadent flower and a very delicate hint of perfume initially, which became rather more off-putting, I think, as it developed overnight. But it's just an exciting plant to look at. It's quite unusual for a cactus, and it's epiphytic, and is climbing up this supporting host tree using these wonderful pads, which have these very, very bristly leaf margins. A real treat for us this year. One of the highlights of the glass houses is our jade vine, Strongylodon macrobotrys. It's a real showstopper and has just started flowering and in a good year will carry on flowering through April, potentially into the beginning of May. But you can see these beautiful, extraordinarily coloured pea-like flowers that are bat pollinated. One of the great things about visiting the garden and venturing through the glass houses is that you can jump from continent to continent and country to country. And this species comes from the Philippines where it grows in the rainforests and where these beautiful pendant racines hang from the rainforest canopy to bring, I imagine, an extraordinary glow to a dark, gloomy habitat. We've now ventured from the Philippines to India with the beautiful Mysore clock vine that you can see here. It's related to the black eye Susie that we're very familiar with. But what a treat to find this growing in your back garden in the Indian continent. It really is a, a full of colour and vibrancy and a treat here in the garden and should continue producing flower through much of the summer now fading off in autumn, but just as you can see dripping here with these beautiful racines again of flower. So we've now come behind the scenes. This is part of our private collection of plants, many of which are grown to go out on display in the houses permanently, but some which get moved between these houses and the permanent public houses when they're in full flower. And this is an area that people love to have a peep at. It really does, I think, 
have a concentration of plants like you wouldn't see in the front houses, but also there's always a mysticism about what you might find growing in here. And it's a real treat, even for the horticultural staff, to come and just browse through here and look and study and see what is growing here and just look at some of the detail of the plants. We've headed in now to our tropical reserve house and I'm stood amongst some of our tropical orchids. There is an orchid pretty much for every day of the year. They provide so much diversity in colour, form, flowering season that they really do inspire many growers and it's one of the largest plant families in the plant kingdom. I'm stood here now by this vibrant flower of Cattleya orantiaca. It's an extraordinary plant. It almost looks as if it's plastic in its form and texture. It has a real sheen to these delicate petals and this lower lip particularly. It's named after an 18th century supporter of botany who funded expeditions, went on collecting expeditions and sent many of his specimens to John Lindley of what is now the Royal Horticultural Society. And as a reward for sharing so many of his specimens with him, Lindley named this particular genus of orchid after Catley himself, hence the name Catlia. And who wouldn't be honored to have this beautiful specimen named after them? So continuing with our exploration theme, we've moved from Central America and the Cattleya over towards two Olbophyllum species, just to show you the diversity of the genus in their floral forms. The first of these is Bulbophyllum lepidium, which comes from temperate Asia and tropical Asia, and is just extraordinary in its form. But beside it, we have a species from Western tropical Africa, growing through into Kenya and then into Angola, so an African species, which is quite extraordinary in these very, very tiny flowers that you can see here, which are almost feather-like in appearance. And these do move in a gentle breeze, as I'm demonstrating here by flapping my hand. So as bees and insects move by, they help move these flowers and distribute the pollen and ensure pollination. The reserve houses act as a nursery for both us and for growing on plants to share with other botanic gardens around the world. And I'm here now with our Titan Aran babies. Some of you may recall in 2017, us flowering Amorphophallus titanum or the Titan Aran. And we were successful in hand pollinating it. And you can see here a great row of young plants from that successful pollination, which we were delighted to have been able to grow on. This will represent one of the largest collections of this species anywhere in the world. And we hope that by having successfully grown them on quite as well as we have, we'll be able to share these with botanic gardens throughout the world to ensure that this threatened plant is at least guaranteed a future, if not in its wild habitat in Sumatra, at least in collections of the world for us to enjoy and recall and actually wonder at the wonderful world of plants. We're finishing our exploration tour here with some of our passifloras or passion flowers. And although they're not in flower at the moment, we can expect these to show flower later in the summer. But one of the interesting things about these plants is that many of their leaves, as this one, are shaped rather like a moth. And this helps deter moth predators from either eating the leaf or destroying the flowers or the pollen. So this is a very, very extraordinary relationship that exists between the moths and the genus Passiflora. But one of the more exciting aspects of our collection of Passiflora, of which we have numerous throughout the reserve houses and our public houses, is that one of our members of staff, our assistant curator, has recently been on an expedition to Colombia. 
exploring the wonderful flora of that region of the world, but particularly focusing on passion flowers. And she was able to introduce new species here to our collection for us to enjoy, but also to be used as study. And one of the more exciting aspects of that trip is that of the collections that were made, one is believed to be new to science, but there's much more discovery and exploration for us institutionally, but this also serves to highlight the value of us protecting habitats throughout the world and better understanding and extending our knowledge of the plant kingdom globally. I hope you've enjoyed this exploration behind the scenes at the Botanic Garden. If you're local and able to visit, the garden is open and you're welcome to come and explore our entire 40 acre site to see more of the floral fantasies that appeal to us and hope will to you. We hope that nature's calendar is as uplifting for you as it is for us.